What's up, Human Geography? Time for us to talk about the Cold War. We're in Unit 4, Political Geography, and so it's really important for you to understand the two big Cs. We've already covered colonialism and imperialism, which is one of them, and the other one is the Cold War. So remember that those two big Cs are the things that really kind of lay the groundwork or, or even straight up cause a lot of the problems and issues and tensions and friction that we see throughout the world today. Uh, they're legacies of these things that you may think of as far in the past, but in a lot of people's cultural memories, they are very much pertinent. So let's talk Cold War today. Um, you should know that the Cold War was uh, pretty much a direct result of World War II. World War II kind of left two superpowers in the world. Everyone else in Europe was kind of broken. They had been the superpowers, but because of World War II, they were kind of broken. Um, so that left really the United States and the USSR. And anytime you have two superpowers or two parties, much like you see in United States politics today, it's problematic because they only have each other to go against. So there's there tends to not be as much communication as there should be. There tends to be a lot more uh, uh, competition uh, than there should be. So the map that you're looking at right now, you see the dark blue, those are kind of your, uh, sorry, dark blue over here, the United States, that's one superpower. Dark red over here, the USSR, that's the other superpower and essentially their allies. Uh, the, the darkness of the color being like kind of strongest allies or members, essentially. You have NATO, which is a term you should know, the North American Treaty Organization. Uh, which has to do with alliances, mostly military alliances, um, kind of assuring peace, similar to what happened before World War I. You've got your your team versus their team. Uh, the blue team is essentially NATO. The red team is what's called the Warsaw Pact, the agreement between those dark red countries, mostly Eastern Europe, um, that were part of the USSR's team. Um, blue, light blue countries tend to be aligned with NATO, light red countries tend to be aligned with the Warsaw Pact, and then you see the little X's, each X, as you can tell down here, communist guerrillas, so uh, you'll see that the red X's are in the blue states, meaning they had communist uprisings in those countries, and some of those countries still have those same communist uprisings. Um, and then same with the blue X's. Blue X's you'll see in red countries are the anti-communist guerrillas, or kind of like uprisings. You might think of them as rebels. Okay, our big deal today when we're talking about the Cold War is to understand uh, some of the politics and the theories that led to a lot of the stuff that happened during the Cold War, setting up a lot of the stuff that has happened since. So let's go there. What you need to know today is uh, you should be able to define heartland, rimland, and containment and shatterbelt theories, all four of those. Um, with those, you should be able to put a geographer's name. They typically don't ask you for the guy's name, but it's nice to know because sometimes they'll reference it that way. Um, and you should also understand what the domino effect is. We'll get to the cracks part as one of these theories. Okay, so let's start with Heartland theory. This is the oldest theory about world power. Essentially, all of these theories are considering world power and how to control it. Heartland is kind of the first when it comes to controlling world power. Uh, world War II kind of saw uh, the the real the the real modern now global world where everything is pretty closely interconnected. So. That led to this development of the Heartland Theory. Now, this is by a guy named Mackinder. Mackinder, in 1904, notice that this is even before World War I, um, Mackinder came up with this idea, this theory, that if you could control this red area, which he called the Heartland, um, that was the, uh, the, the part of the world that was the, the majority of the world island. So you see the world island is all of Asia and Africa and Europe since they're all connected and it's the biggest landmass, essentially contiguous landmass in the world. He called that the world island. But McKinder's idea was that the heartland 
was the area of the world that had the best resources, the most concentrated resources, and so therefore was essentially the powerhouse of the world, the resource powerhouse of the world. And therefore, if you could control the heartland, then you could control the world because you had the resources and therefore the wealth and the power. Okay. Um, now you'll see that this becomes problematic. Problematic because, let's go back to our map here, who's in charge of the heartland during the Cold War? The USSR. So this was seen as a big danger to essentially all of NATO, all those blue countries, is that the USSR controlled the heartland and therefore, by Mackinder's theory, essentially controlled the power of the world. And this is something that they didn't want to happen. Because during the Cold War, he had the competing ideas of communism, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, both an economic and political system, and democracy and capitalism, which uh, the, the two of which are polar opposites of each other. Uh, communism was created as an answer to the problems of capitalism and democracy. So they're really polar opposites. And so therefore, the existence of one is a threat to the other, especially when the existence of one, in this case, communism, controls the heartland, which people are saying is the powerhouse of the world. Okay, so that's the, seen as a threat to NATO. Okay, heartland, Mackinder, that's your basis. That's where everything else functions off of. Okay. Now, note that that's an old theory, meaning that there were other theories that came up later that answered those theories and kind of shifted the rhetoric, shifted the perspective on how the Cold War could play out or would play out. Okay, so the next one, the next theory then, kind of an answer to the Heartland theory, and you can see it here in this picture, is the Rimland theory. The Rimland, and I'll take you back here, or bigger here, we can see the Rimland is the blue area that surrounds the Heartland. And what do you notice about that? Uh, Rimland theory says, sure, the Heartland has all of the resources. Sure, the Heartland is the powerhouse of the world. And if you control that, that makes you pretty powerful. However, the comeback to it is that, sorry, I'll flip back there again. That heartland, if you see the red, is entirely surrounded by land. Um, yes, okay, there's ocean up here, but if you know anything about climate, and if you look straight, well, almost straight across latitude here, you see that that's all Arctic Ocean. So essentially that's inaccessible, like it says here. That's mostly frozen almost all year round. So in other words, if you're going to trade with the rest of the world, if you're going to do anything with those resources that you can control in the heartland, you have to have access to the ports of the Rimland. And so, therefore, here we go to Rimland, Spyman, the guy who came up with it, Spyman says, if you control the Rimland, then you can control the heartland because you can control their resources going out to the world. And so therefore you control the power of the world. See how these kind of stack up with each other. Heartland, control the resources. So control the world. Rimland, control the, control the heartland. And so therefore control the resources. And so therefore control the world. Kind of a building of theories. And the rest of them are no different. They build on these ideas. Okay, so this becomes a big Cold War idea for both sides, the U.S. and the USSR. Both of them realize that they that the USSR, to have any real power, has to get out into this rimland. They have to control things in that rimland so that they can then, therefore, access the world trade networks. Okay, and the U.S., Therefore, if they want to limit the power of the USSR and defeat the USSR in any way, which has, by the way, only ever been defeated once by the Mongols, um, then they need to control the Rimland. So it all becomes this kind of battleground in the Rimland. By the way, look at the countries who are there. A lot of developing countries, which means you're going to have that they, they, they might look like easy pickings to these two superpowers. That's exactly what happens. All right, let's talk containment theory. This one's pretty simple. This is entirely the United States whole perspective, guideline, strategy 
in the Cold War is to contain the spread of communism. The idea by the U.S. is that they will not let communism spread outside of the USSR. They will contain it by making sure that nothing, that no communist nation in here, or sorry, so that, that, that no state in the Rimland becomes communist. They, there's this whole idea from both sides now of creating buffer states to protect each other from the other side. Because this area is kind of somewhat non-aligned. Let's go all the way back here. There, there's a lot of difference in where the alignment comes in, whose side is whose in this rimland. Um, so the idea of containment is to make sure that one side or the other controls them to buffer their effects from each other, to protect each other, uh, to protect the one from the other and vice versa. Okay. Um, the other thought here with containment, at least by the U.S., is that if one of these areas in the Rimland falls to communism, then that will make it easier for others to fall to communism. So if one falls, then the whole domino effect starts and communism escapes from containment and is a major threat to the world because now they're into that Rimland and can now control the power of the world. Okay, I hope this is all making sense. All right, that takes us to our last one. The last one is Shatterbelt theory. Shatterbelt, again, by this guy Cohen, Saul Cohen, builds on the idea of the heartland and the rimland. Okay? Cohen changes a little bit of the wording. He ends up calling the, the heartland the pivot area, and he ends up calling the rimland the inner crescent. Uh, I don't know why he decided to change the name, um, but there you go. What he adds to it, and this goes with the whole idea of containment and everything, what he adds to it is the idea of the shatter belts. He says that there are a series of shatter belts throughout the Inner Crescent, at least during the, the Cold War, they were throughout the Inner Crescent. Um, so where each of those stars is, is considered it was considered to be by Cohen one of the shatter belts. Um, and those shatter belts are areas of, quote, geopolitical weakness. Let me go to the next slide because it's got the, the explanation. Okay, so Saul Cohen is the guy in 1950, the beginning of the Cold War, essentially. Uh, renames it all, which I already said. Okay, and he predicts that if there are going to be conflicts in the Cold War, they will almost all of them occur in the Inner Crescent. And for the most part, Cohen was right. All, uh, almost all of the conflicts of the Cold War occurred within that inner crescent, okay? Um, outside of those communist guerrillas that we talked about, outside of, say, Cuba um, becoming communist, most of the other stuff occurred within that inner crescent. Uh, it was the USSR or the US jockeying for buffer states, and those buffer states were areas of, uh, like it says here, geopolitical weakness, um, as in weaker than the competing superpowers, okay? All right, the shatter belts were also, in regards to containment, they were communism breaking out of containment or, depending on which perspective you want to take, uh, democracy and capitalism breaking into the heartland to try to control it or into the rimland to try to control the heartland, right? Okay. You will also notice, I'll take you back to the map here in a second, you'll also notice that a lot of these shatter belts are places that had conflicts during the Cold War. Uh, for instance, Korea, Afghanistan, Vietnam, um, Af I already said Afghanistan, Eastern Europe, uh, Israel, so on and so forth, um, throughout the Middle East even. So let's go back to that map really quick. Okay. So um, think about what you know about, say, the Korean War. That's uh, the north of Korea becoming communist, the south being uh, or being more influenced by communism, the south being more influenced by democracy and capitalism. You've got Vietnam, which did the exact same thing. Um, you've got the Philippines, where there was some fighting about who would be in power over it. China, which had also become communist, and the U.S. interests there. Um, you've got 
here in Kashmir, which is a name you should know for human geography. Kashmir is this area kind of between Pakistan and India, where there are conflicting religions and ethnicities, and they're in the inner crescent because you've got disagreement and conflict in places that had recently become decolonized. Um, those are geopolitically weak, and so areas that the USSR can spread into or the US can support or spread into, you know, whichever way you want to look at it. Afghanistan, oh man, Russia has had its eye on Afghanistan for years. Af Russia's basically main motivation throughout almost their entire military and imperial history is trying to get a port. It's pretty much it. I mean, again, you go back to the idea that they've got all this coastline, but the vast majority of it is frozen year round. Yeah, they've got a fair amount of coastline here, but again, it's relatively remote, relatively, especially since the majority of their population lives here. They got to truck it across the largest country in the world to try to export here. It's just not typically feasible. Anyway, so they're constantly trying to spread down to gain ports, to gain access to the World Trade Network. Okay. Oh, and of course, Eastern Europe, right? Uh, you've got the Berlin Wall. You've got divided East and West Germany during this time. Uh, you've got all the conflicts that, that come up throughout here, Yugoslavia breaking up, things like that. All right. That's the Cold War theories in a relative nutshell. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you next time.